Well, good morning. We can get started. Um, I'll open us in a word of prayer, and we will be in Genesis chapter 6. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come to you, and we thank you for another morning. We thank you that your faithfulness to us remains day after day. That though we sin, and sometimes sin grievously, you are still loving, you are still gracious to us. Father, we pray as we open your word this morning, we pray that your spirit would be among us and teach us, encourage us, convict us. Father, we pray that you would guide our discussion, Lord, let it be profitable for each one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in Genesis 6. Today we're going to aim to make it through Genesis 8, verse 19. So we're going to try and cover all of the, the flood narrative in the first eight verses of chapter six. Um, so, so far we've seen that God has created this world. Specifically, we focus on him creating a man and a woman in his image and in his likeness. And they're to do what? What is the commission God gives them? What's the command? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Fill the earth, subdue the earth. Genesis 2, we find this idea that he puts them in a garden. He gives them freedom in the garden. This generosity is emphasized. Where they can eat freely of any tree in the garden except for one. If they eat this one tr fruit of the tree, they will die, surely die. Genesis 3, what happens? They eat the fruit they're not supposed to, right? And God comes down and he tries to draw a confession out of Adam. And Adam is pointing at the woman. And then he addresses the woman and she points to who? The serpent. And who else? God himself, right? It's Oh, well, no, that's what Adam did. Sorry. She points to the serpent. <clears throat> then God starts to do what at the, the second half of chapter 3? Start to see consequences for their sin, right? The serpent is going to be on its belly all the days of its life. It's going to eat of the dust. But even in the midst of addressing the serpent, what do we see in verse 15? Mercy. Mercy. Yeah, how? Yeah, he's going to clothe them. What do we see in 15, though? A promise of, of redemption, right? We have a promise that there's going to come one from the line of the woman that will crush the head of the serpent. But in the meantime, what kind of relationship are we going to have between the line of the woman and the line of the serpent? What will characterize that relationship? I will put what? Enmity, right? So there's going to be this hostile relationship. We get into chapter 4, which we saw last time we were in Genesis. And what do we have? We have a godly line and a what? An ungodly line. And the ungodly line kills the godly line. And we say what? Oh no, what's going to happen to this promise? We've been given this promise that an offspring of the woman is going to have one that crushes the head of the serpent. And it seems to be that the one that brings the offering that God accepts dies. And all we have is this wicked man. God, being faithful to his word, gives Adam and Eve another son named Seth. And we see a detail of his line and in chapter 5. And remember, there was one sliver of hope in this chapter 5, which is dominated by the word, and they died. There's one who doesn't die. Who's that? Enoch. Enoch. <clears throat> so we have this glimmer of hope that death is not the final word, that there is hope in the midst of, of this 
death-dominating chapter, there is hope of escaping death. It's just a glimmer of hope, but there is a glimmer of hope. We end chapter 5 with this man named Noah. Anyone remember what Noah's name means? Something we've already seen, chapter 2. What did God do on the seventh day? He rested. No one means rest. So we come to chapter 6. Somebody want to read chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any as they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Through six or through eight? Through eight. Okay. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. All right, so this is a weird section, right? We have some things that we're like, what is going on here? If you like getting into those things, I'm going to disappoint you today because we're not going to spend a lot of time on them, right? We can, people can write whole books on this and then they conclude their book with, we're not really sure. And I'm like, why did you just spend all this time writing a book with a conclusion that you're not really sure? What I do want to do is say, here are the options. So this whole thing about Nephilim and uh, sons of God coming into the, the, you know, all of this, the daughters of man, what is going on? There's three options. All of them have strengths and weaknesses. First view is that this is a reference to kings. In the Bible, there are times, especially in the Psalms, where kings are called sons of God. Think about David. What is he called? A what? Son of God, right? So some people think sons of gods are kings and they are taking women as they see, you know, see fit, which is an abuse of their authority. There's another view that what have we just seen? What are, we have Genesis 3, there's going to be an offspring of the woman, there's going to be offspring of the serpent, in a sense, sons of God and People who aren't sons of God. So some people think in the context, what we see is the godly line, rather than staying with other godly people, is taking people from the other the ungodly line, and they are, in a sense, having, you know, what, what the New Testament might call, they might be unequally yoked, which would be a problem. Then there's this third view in the book of Job. Sons of God is a reference to angels. I don't know what that means is going on here. It does seem to be in the book of Jude, verse 6 through 8, as well as 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 10. When they comment, it seems to be they're commenting on this section and they address it as if they're angels. I don't know what's going on here, to be completely honest. You got three options. And I'm going to conclude, like all the rest of those books, rather than yakking for an hour about here's all the strengths and weaknesses, I'm going to tell you I don't know what is going on. What we do see is clear is that something that is happening here is unnatural and it's simple, right? Whatever kind of Whatever these people or angels are, the relationship they're having is displeasing to the Lord. We can all agree that that's very plain, right? Whatever happening here, this is not pleasing to the Lord. Any questions on that? I, I know 
Like everybody gets to this section and they're like, ooh, let's spend a lot of time on this. We spent all of three minutes on it. So if that's disappointing, if you have a question, we can, we can talk a little bit about it. Any questions? I know I just set you up to not ask any questions, but. <laughs> Great. Verse three. <laughs> then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There is debate about this verse as well. Is this verse saying there is a hundred and twenty years till the flood? The Lord's giving a hundred and twenty years for mankind to repent of this evil that we've just detailed in verses one through two. Or is he saying, because of this, I'm going to be gracious and not let you live all that long. I'm going to limit mankind's days to about 120 years. Knowing that there are some exceptions as you go through the book of Genesis, there are some people who live a little bit longer, but generally people are not living past 120 years, which is different than we just read in chapter five, where they're, they're living like eight, 900 years. Again, I think the second one makes a lot more sense. It does seem that there's a shift here in this chapter of we go from people living like Methuselah, who's 900 and however many, 969 years to people who are generally living about 120 years. So I think that's probably what God is doing here, limiting their life. Um, but verse five is where we want to kind of slow down. What did you read in verse one? Is there a word that you've seen already in the book of Genesis that we read in chapter six, verse one? Multiply. Multiply. So when did we read that? Genesis chapter one, verse what? That's right. Verse 28. Genesis 1, 28, be fruitful and multiply. What is man doing in verse six to chapter six, verse one? They're doing exactly what God said. But as man multiplies and increases in the earth, what else is spreading with them? In verse 5. What's that? Wickedness. As man is filling the earth, rather than being this glory-reflecting image bearer that is reflecting God's glory and reflecting God's authority, what is coming with man now? Post-fall. Sin. Sin. The Lord saw. Why is that important? What, why is that phrase important? The Lord saw. He sees everything. So therefore, his assessment of what is going on is what? Correct. It's accurate, right? It doesn't say the Lord heard about, right? The Lord sees. So his assessment of humanity is going to be based on knowledge based on facts the lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually that is a sad verse right man is wicked and is the, the wickedness of man affects his whole person his whole being Spurgeon of this passage said that as sin or as salt saturates the Atlantic, so sin saturates man. It touches every part of his being, his thoughts, his actions, everything. Is this passage saying man is as evil as they possibly, when he says only evil continually, does that mean man is just as wicked as they possibly can be? So it's just showing us that sin is literally affecting everything. They're, 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 they're rebelling, characterized by just this continual rebellion against God. And the Lord sees this and he's grieved by this. Now, verse 6 introduces some more stuff that is people like to debate about. What it, it says that the Lord's sorry that he made man and it grieves him. So is, is God caught off guard by the fact that man is rebellious? Is God caught off guard and like, oh, wow, didn't see this one coming? 
Because that's, you, if, if we're just reading it quickly, we could read it that way. He's grieved that he did this and he's, he's sorrowful that he did this. I don't think that's what's happening here. I think we're seeing an infinite God and his attitude towards sin put in language that finite people can understand. It's, it's in a sense God condescending into human terms he doesn't react to our actions. He's, he's not changeable. He knows what's going to happen. But his heart is grieved by sin, and he puts it into language that we would understand. So I don't, what I don't want us to walk away is thinking that God changes. Or that he's surprised by things. Like, whoop, didn't see that one coming. That wasn't in the plan. Now i got to scramble and figure something out. I think what we're seeing here is God, God's heart towards sin being put in, in language that human beings speaking. He's grieved by sin. Well, we do that too. Because do. even when there, there are times when we know that something sorrowful or something bad is coming, like we, can, we know that something's going to happen, but when it happens, we still feel it just yep. as fully. Like yep. our emotions don't get diminished just because we know it's coming. Yep. Yeah, it's good. All right, so verse 8. Does anyone have a different translation other than the ESV? Okay, do you have, what does it say where the ESV says favor? Does, what does your translation say? Which one do you have? Okay. Okay. Does anyone have the word grace? What, what translation do you have? King James. New King James also great. Yeah, so I like the word grace here. The idea of this word is we have this sin-filled world now that's being filled with sinners. And it's not that Noah's any different in the sense that he's not a sinner. But God finds grace, gives grace upon Noah. This word has the idea Noah's just in this bunch of sinners as well. And there's this God who's gracious. I like that idea better than Noah's just really great guy. And God's like, oh, you're good. So now I like you. There's grace. Even here in a passage where we're just we're about to read where the whole earth is going to be judged. Eight people are spared, not because of their righteous deeds, but because of God's grace. God's mercy. All right, so now we'll get into kind of the heart of the passage that we're going to be in. Verses 9 to 22. Somebody want to volunteer? 9 to 22. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of our God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you, come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself. And it shall be for food for you and for them. That's Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him. 
All right, thank you. So anybody remember when we see that word, these are the generations of, what is it showing us in Genesis? It's a section header. It's kind of like a section header. So now we're entering a new section and this is the one about Noah and his, his life. Now, what do you see in verse nine that might completely contradict what I said in verse eight? So is God going to give favor to him because he's a righteous man? Didn't I just say something about grace and praise the Lord? He didn't look at Noah because he's this perfectly righteous guy and like, oh, of course I'm going to spare him. I just said the opposite. And then we're reading in verse 9, he's a righteous man. He's blameless. He walks with God. What do we do with that? Skip over to verse 18. So he's going to judge the earth, right? He, he's going to flood it. He's going to destroy all flesh. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark. Your son, you, your sons, your wife, your son's wives with you. That word establish. Some of you ladies are reading through kingdom, kingdom through covenant. Have you gotten to the section on Noah? Anybody remember what the authors of that big, thick book argue that this word means? To cut. to cut a covenant. This word in Hebrew doesn't have the idea of establishing something new. It has the idea of upholding something that's already been made. There has been a covenant already made in the book of Genesis. Where did we read about that covenant? It doesn't have the language specifically coming out saying, I'm making a covenant with you. But where did we find the elements of a covenant? With who? Commission to Adam. Adam, right? We have this idea of God speaking to a covenant partner, the under ruler, and he's giving him commands and stipulations. Here's blessings if you obey and curses if you disobey. There is this covenant made at creation to uphold and care for, sustain, preserve life, creation, Adam. The idea here is that Noah is going to be preserved not because of his obedience and righteousness. He's going to be preserved because of God's covenant faithfulness. God's already made a covenant with Adam at creation. And now we're seeing he's going to uphold that covenant in spite of man's rebellion. And the fruits of Adam or of Noah being in this relationship with God, this covenant relationship with God, is that he's a righteous man. He's blameless. It's an outflow of his covenant relationship with God. I love the wording in verse 9, Noah walked with God. Where did we read that already? The garden. Yep, God's coming down and walking with man. Where else did we read that? Enoch. Yeah, so this is somebody that seems to be spiritually like Enoch. He walks with God. All right, so we'll go back. Verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And it was filled with violence. The word filled, we've seen that word filled already, right? Genesis 1, 28, fill the earth. Man is doing that. The only problem is he's not reflecting God's glory at this point. He's filling it with violence. And the Lord saw the earth. Again, it's important. He sees it. He's, his judgment is going to be based on facts. It's going to be right. It's going to be just. All flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So God is going to make an end of all flesh. He's going to destroy them. In the midst of judgment, what do we see in verse 14? I'm going to judge the earth, but I'm going to do what? Provides a way of preservation. He's going to provide a way of escape for some. He's going to He's going to provide salvation, deliverance for some. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. So let's skip down to verse 22. 
What did Noah do in response to God's command to build an ark and fill it with food for him, his family and for the animals? What does he do? He does everything the Lord commands. Do you realize how crazy this is? God speaks to Noah, build this massive boat. It hasn't rained on the earth at this point. Build this massive boat. And Noah starts building a boat. And people are probably coming by saying, what are you doing? I'm building a boat. What for? Because it's going to flood. Everything's going to flood. And people are like, what's a flood? It hasn't rained yet. What are you talking about? We have no concept. Well, the Lord's going to judge the earth. And what do you think their response is going to be like? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. No, they're this guy's nuts. He's off his rocker. He's, he's taking wood and assembling a boat for a flood that's supposed to come. And I am sure he is getting mocked. I'm sure people are like, oh, this guy is just, he's lost it. He's, he's literally just lost his marbles. But his building of a boat is an act of what? And notice Noah's faith is put into action here. God says, I'm going to flood the earth. You can escape if you build a boat. And Noah's like, I trust his word. I, I don't know what a flood is. It hasn't rained yet. We've, not, we've never seen a flood. But if God said, there's going to be a flood, I should build a boat. I trust him. This is an act of faith. It's an act of faith in God's word. God promises he's going to flood the earth, and guess what he does in chapter 7? He's faithful to his promise. Remember we said in chapter 5, the Lord is faithful to all of his positive promises. Normally when we say the Lord's faithful, it's in a positive light. We're like, he keeps his promise to save us. He keeps his promise to not stop loving us. And we're like, praise God for his faithfulness. He also promises, he's also faithful to his promises to judge. All of his words, all of his, all of his declarations, he does what he says. He says they're going to die when they eat. What happens in chapter 5? They die. He says he's going to flood the earth. Guess what he does in chapter 7? Floods the earth. So we have to be a people as Christians who are very sobered by God's faithfulness. It should be a great encouragement to us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. No matter what our situation, he's faithful. He's there. He's with us. He will keep us to the end, right? Those who whom the Father has given him, he will in no way cast out, and he will lose none that the Father gave him. Praise the Lord. He's faithful to his promise. But there is also a reality for those outside of Christ, that there is, there has been a declaration of what the Lord will do for all eternity to those who are outside of Christ. And that is a reality. He will keep his promise. And that, and that type of faithfulness to his word should sober us should open our eyes to those around us. That there is an eternity before them as well. And the only hope they have, we, we have that message. So this should, in a sense, give us urgency to tell people about Christ. So chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of birds of the, he the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will rain, send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every, li every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. We've seen it in chapter 6. We see it again twice in verse 4 here. Who is taking responsibility for the flood? I will. I will. 
Lord's sovereign here over his creation. He's saying, I'm going to bring a flood. I'm going to bring judgment. Verse 6, Noah was 600 years old. That's a lot. That's a lot of years to be working on a boat. This is an old man who's building a boat. <clears throat> Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground two and two male and female went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah <clears throat> and after seven days the waters of the flood came upon the earth in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day of the month on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were open and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Hey, guess who just said he was going to do that for 40 days and 40 nights? God did. And what did he do? Exactly what he said he was going to do. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kind. And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as the Lord had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. <clears throat> this is where we'll kind of slow down a little bit again. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens that were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. This is a sobering text. We don't know how many people are alive at this time. We don't know how big the population is. But there's a lot of people. And eight people survive. God's justice is seen here. He judges the earth. And what do we see here? We have the idea of flood waters that are covering the mountains. We have an earth that is covered by water. Have we seen that before in Genesis? What? Somebody said something. Yeah, Genesis chapter one, verse two, what did we have? We had what? A Here world that's formless and void. Earth formless and void, and what else? The spirit of God. Yeah, and we have the idea of this, this mass of just water, an uninhabitable, water-covered globe, no dry land yet, right? Chaos, inhabitableness for humans. What do we have at the end of chapter 7? Same thing, right? In a sense, I don't know if this is a word, but we're going to make it a word today. He's decreating. He, he's, in a sense, bringing us back to a pre-ordered world. And we're going to see in what we're going to look at in chapter 8 of today, that there's going to be very similar language to the days of creation. So we're going to have a, a decreated world. God judges the world. And then we're going to, in a sense, get a new creation, a whole new world. So let's start chapter 8. And when we get to verse 19, we'll stop and we can have discussion. Verse 8. 
Notice the first four words, but God remembered Noah. If you were to take the, the flood narrative, all the words, the very center of this entire narrative are these four words. And sometimes when Moses writes, he's very creative with his structure and intentional with his structure. When this is the middle like this, it's intentionally meant to be the main point of the whole text. In the midst of all of this judgment, God remembers Noah. God has not forgotten his covenant partner. His faithfulness, his covenant grace towards his covenant partner is not forgotten. He remembers Noah. That word but, it's a glorious word in the Bible. Like, you have this idea of judgment, but God has not forgotten Noah. He's not forgotten his child. You have, Gen you have Ephesians 3, or 2, verses 1 through 3 that are just like, man is dead in sin. He's following the course of the world. He's following the prince of the power of the air. And he's a child of wrath, meaning he deserves wrath, but God being rich in mercy. Right? Same idea here. Judgment, 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 but God remembered Noah. Why is Noah still alive? Because of God's faithful grace to him. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. So we have a an earth filled with water and Chadwick, you said something that happened in Genesis 1 verse 2 was what? The spirit hovered. Ah, that word in Hebrew for spirit, it's a fun word to say because you get to do that like throat thing. It's ruach. Guess what word is here for wind? You got to say it with a... <laughs> <laughs> Same word, right? Now, I think it's good to translate it wind here. But the fact that he uses the same language is going to, to trigger our mind to think about what? Genesis 1 verse 2. An earth covered with water and ruach. Here we have it. So we're, we're reading through Genesis for the first time. You think about this. You're a Hebrew person reading for the first time and you're thinking earth covered with water. Oh, we've seen that word for wind or spirit before. It reminds us of Genesis 1, where God is now bringing order to his creation. Verse 2, the foundations of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed, closed, and the rains from the heavens were restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. <clears throat> And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to the end of the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. We have an earth covered with water, and now dry land is coming about. We see that before, an earth covered with water, and then God causes land. He separates the waters and causes dry land to appear. Do you read that ever in Genesis yet up to this point? Yes. Genesis 1, day 3, right? We're seeing now land appear. Verse 6. <clears throat> the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the windows of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. There's going to be multiple birds sent out. If we read birds coming into the air in Genesis? He did. Birds filled the air, day five, right? So he sends out a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove went back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a flesh, freshly plucked olive leaf. 
So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. In the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. That wording is very similar to what we read in Genesis 1, right? We have animals swarming and, and things that are creeping on the ground. And what are they supposed to do when they go out, according to this text? Verse 17. Be what? You read that, right? In chapter one? Yes. You get the end of day six. Animals are to be fruitful and multiply. Humans are to be fruitful and multiply. What are we seeing here up to verse 19? We have a decreated earth, a uh, back to Genesis 1, verse 2 kind of earth, and we're ending verse 19 with a what kind of earth? Genesis 1.28 kind of earth, right? Where we have an earth with dry land that's habitable. We have plants. We have birds in the sky. We have land animals. We have a commission to be fruitful and multiply. We are going to see here a foretaste of what is going to play out for the rest of the Bible. Man is rebellious and sinful but God in his mercy saves some and there will come a judgment on the earth. Second Peter talks about it this time. It will be a fire. But what happens after this kind of destructive decreation? There will be a what? A new heaven and a new earth. We're seeing seed form in Genesis, something that the rest of the Bible is going to play out. God's intention from the very beginning was to take this rebellious, depraved kind of people and by his mercy, bring them back to Genesis 1, where there is a good earth, a new earth. And, well, I don't want to give away. What we're going to see next time is Noah's going to do the same thing Adam did. So there's going to have to be something that's going to be different then Adam and Noah, that's going to have to happen. And I'm going to stop talking about that now because that'll just, you won't even have to come back next time. So, <clears throat> all right. So any questions or comments? I know we read a lot of text and I talked really fast, but any questions? We got 15 minutes. Ask whatever we want. Anything stick out? Anything I say you disagree with? We can talk about it. Disagreement. Yes. Not I guess I hear the word regret and sin a lot, yeah. and like, so I guess I'm wondering, like, we're not sinning that God sinned, but like, why is the word regret? Yeah. I know you said like using human like like human language, but I think I'm just really like still confused on that. Yep. Anyone have you have the King James? What does the King James say? <laughs> Repented. Even stronger language, right? <laughs> Even more help. <clears throat> the idea here is putting it into human terms that, that this is not right. The state that humanity in is not right. But creating humanity was right. Right. And did we have to make the distinction here where we are in the storyline. How did God create man? Genesis 1.31. Everything he made was what? 
Not good, but what? Very good. Good, good, right? God does not make Genesis 3 happen. Like, yes, we know God's sovereign and like everything is under his sovereign hand, right? But God does not come into the garden and say, you better eat this. You don't screw up this plan of mine. You have to do this. Man willfully rebels. Man willfully brings himself into a state of rebellion. So we're not seeing here God repenting of something he did wrong or regretting something he did wrong. He's putting into language for us to understand that what he is seeing is something, this is not the way that I intended. This, I intended a, a humanity that is not sinning, a humanity that is in communion with me, a humanity that isn't eating the fruit, it, that isn't filling the earth with violence. And, he, and God doesn't do this in, in the sense that we would have like, I never should have done that. Why did I do that? Like, that's how the language reads to us. Like, if we're humans and we're like, I wouldn't have done that if I saw that coming. I think he puts it into language like this for us to understand, to have some concept of like, if this rust, this is not what I intend. Like, this is not what I, this is not what I, I, I designed you for. So, but for us, the language is confusing, right? We're like, wait a second, this is how we use it this way. I don't think God's intending it to be used the way that we use repent or regret because we do something wrong. Does that help? It does. I think it's just hard because I've heard a lot of non-Christians use that verse to like really like twist God's character yeah. and that he's like yeah. evil God. Yeah. And so like, I think that's helpful for like that kind of like conversation. Yeah. But with God's omniscience, He would have known that man was fallen. Yeah. And if, if he had intended man not to fall, I think they would I think they would not have fallen. Correct. So he had to have the whole plan of Jesus and redemption and salvation and his people and all of that in order before he ever created anything. And so even our brokenness is part of his plan. Yeah. Is that correct? It is. <clears throat> so I think on a high level, we have to say this. J or James 1 talks about God does not tempt any man to sin. God, God is not the author of evil. He can't be blamed with evil. We have that clear black and white doctrine right there. God does nothing wrong. We also have the idea that God is absolutely 100% sovereign over everything that happens. The fall, all of that is under, it didn't like come outside of God's plan in like somehow this thing happened that he's not sovereign. We have to, we have to hold both of those. He does not do anything wrong. He's sovereign over everything, even the mess that this world is. And we then, as people, like to figure things out and say, well, how does that work? I don't know. I know that he does nothing wrong. I know he's sovereign, even over the fall. <clears throat> the question becomes, how does that work? And this is where I just say, I don't know. And... I don't like saying that. I want to know. But I'm okay resting in the fact that I'm a finite human trying to understand things of an infinite God and I'm never going to grasp it. And I have to, and I've had to wrestle with this like emotionally and just like, how, is this compatible? But at the end of the day, I have to say, I trust his word to be true. And I'm going to bank on that. Knowing that he sees the whole picture, I know. It's kind of like Job, right? Like, I don't see why you're doing this. And then at the end, God doesn't give him an answer. But he's like, 
I make everything work like this and you don't know how I do any of that. So you can trust me with this stuff. You can trust me with the other stuff. And it's just where, I, I mean, I don't know if that helps you, but that's just kind of where I fall back on the end of the day is I'm not God and I don't know if he does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just to that point, I was reading uh, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God by J.I. Packer. He does a really good job of explaining this concept of an antinomy, which is when we have those two things, two doctrines that we can't deny seem to contradict each other. And he makes this point that the Bible's response to something like that is not to say, okay, man, now figure out all the connections. It's to say, well, God has given you both of these things, believe them and trust God. And where we see that, an example of that in the Bible is in Romans 9 which, you know, controversial passage, but can't deny that Paul says, like, who are you, man, to answer back to God? So, like, basically say, God, how can you, like, you know, hold man responsible and yet be sovereign, for instance, right? And Paul's answer is, well, trust God, right? And, and I think that's a helpful, at least the Packer's response, like a helpful way for, like, when something is truly, like, you just have to take both, that's there's going to be wrestling and there's going to be like you know figuring a lot out and that's okay but at, this, at the end of the day a lot of them will have to just say all right i trust you lord it'll be an exercise of faith too yeah so two things on that i want to say number one is god has given us intellect and we should try to say does is there stuff in the bible that reconciles these things to some degree like we should try and see if there is some way for us to understand this in scripture there are a lot of things that you can search the scriptures and you will just come to no answer because god doesn't tell us and the, the illustration i like to use is on anything like that like human responsibility and divine sovereignty existence of evil and divine sovereignty how many people have been to st louis anybody been to st louis what's the famous thing in st louis is what the arch, the arch right so if you were to be, uh, stand under the arch on a cloudy day, you might see that there are these two pillars and the clouds just stop and you don't see them touch, right? But you know what happens. If those clouds aren't away, what do you see? They, they connect, right? Same thing with things like God's sovereignty and the existence of evil. We are seeing just clouds, right? We see a pillar going up here and a pillar going up here. But scripture tells us in God's wisdom, those things do what? They connect. They're, they're reconcilable. They are not in contradiction. Our job here on earth is to just trust that there's going to be a time where we see how they connect. Like there's going to be a time when the clouds are removed and we see clearly. We just don't at this point. Well, for, for me, the fact that we are irreparably broken there is the, the, the top of the arch is Jesus, yeah. you know, that, I mean, the plan makes perfect sense without Jesus. It makes no sense, Zero. but yeah. with him, you know, there's hope for us. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And even here we see the idea of, and we don't want to too much allegorize it, but the idea of <clears throat> in the midst of judgment, a way of escape by faith. Like he has to act in faith to build this ark and get in it. There is a better ark for us. It's not a boat. Like there is a time where this ultimate picture of judgment, there is a way of escape. But just like Noah has to trust God, build an ark, we have to trust God is to trust Jesus. Like, so there is this gospel picture here, even in the midst of this flood narrative. Of, that are, is pointing us to Jesus, that is pointing us to a salvation that God provides for those. Any other questions? I love how, like, sovereignly, like, in the text at this point, um, we're given an example of how to reconcile what actually just happened previously. Because, you know, as I'm you know, listening to the conversation, you know, and we're thinking about seemingly contradictory things. It's almost like God coming to, to Noah, you know, that, hey, this, the flood's going to come, uh, build this boat. How does that even reconcile? Like, what do you mean, build a boat? Yeah. Clouds, it's raining. Uh, and 
That's good. New time for one more question or comment. One question. Can you just, maybe I stopped listening when you explained this part, but That's I right. think it's six, around six, eight, that you said that it's because of race issues. Mm -hmm. No, Noah. Uh, but did you, can you re explain why the next step up? Why does it? Yeah, so the way that I have, when I've studied, the way that people explain it is verse 18 is the key. Where he establishes his covenant or cuts his covenant with Noah is the idea of this is an already existing covenant, reaching back to Adam. So the idea is the reason Noah is receiving grace is not because of something he's done, but because of God's pre-existing covenant. Like there's this gracious, I'm going to keep my covenant in spite of the fact that the earth is filled with a whole bunch of sinners that sin terribly all the time. I've made a covenant with his parents in, in Adam. And this is a descendant from the line of the woman. I'm going to keep that covenant with him. And Noah's blamelessness and righteousness is an outflow of his walking with God as a covenant. Now, there's a, some work that has to be done to get to that conclusion, but I, I do think if the, he's already in this covenant, this, this has been already established, already made, and he's simply keeping this covenant, then I think the idea of grace is there. Rather than just God reacting to something he sees, oh, this is a good little boy, and I'm going to keep him from judgment. Does that make sense at all? If it doesn't, you can, we can keep talking. I do get that. I just maybe that's like why the order is the way it is that the favor comes before the yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think keeping the rest of the Bible in context, man's saved people's manifestation of their relationship with God is certainly caveat certainly imperfect but is one of walking with god in growing in holiness but what precedes that is we're in relationship with god he has by grace brought us in and in there's a relationship established by his grace for us it's in the new covenant right here i think what we have to say is same thing is happening that there is a covenant, there's a relationship because of a covenant, and the outworking in Noah's life is that of righteousness, which we're going to see in chapter 9 is a very imperfect righteousness. He's not a perfect man. He's not a sinless man. But the, the general sweep of his life is that of righteousness and blamelessness. So covenant relationship results in obedience righteousness, not righteousness results in covenant. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like verse eight is the first thing we see, grace. Then we see blamelessness. Yeah, I think it's always like the human responsibility tension that I'm yeah. always trying to sort out in my yep. mind. Um, and like even to have faith. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's stuff that takes, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff to wrestle through. Especially yeah. in the Old Testament when they didn't have the Holy Spirit, so yeah. just like trying to understand even how that's different than how yeah. it is now, because we feel convicted in a different way. And yeah. They, yeah, just... yeah, so Old Testament stuff is very hard for us New Testament people because we have the Spirit, we have Full Revelation, 66 books. They didn't. So understanding where there, there are similarities, but there are differences. And trying to sort out where the similarities and differences are, is, it takes work. So, But that's good that you're trying to say what's similar, what's different. That's, that's the right way to think. Yeah. All right. I am happy to stay after as long as people want and talk. What I would encourage you, if you're going to come back Thursday, is read. Verse 20 all the way through verse or through chapter 9, finish chapter 9. And I would encourage you to see what is similar between Genesis 1 and 2 in this section. Or Genesis 1 through 3. Even where Noah is going to sin, try and see where the similarities are between him and Adam. And there are a bunch. So we'll talk about all that 
on Thursday. So let's pray. Father, thank you for grace. Lord, we thank you, even though there are many differences between us and the Old Testament saints, Lord, we thank you that from the garden to the new creation, you save people by grace. You save sinners by unmerited, undeserved favor. And your people have to respond from Adam all the way to us by faith. Thank you, Lord, that you are merciful, you are gracious, and you do spare us purely because you are a God of love. Lord, thank you that as you provided an ark for them, you have provided for us perfect salvation in your Son. Father, we pray today that you would cause us to have our eyes open to your faithfulness, to your covenant promise to us, that we would rejoice in the fact that you keep your promise that you will bring us to the end, that we will, we will survive the flood of your judgment because of Christ. Father, open our eyes also to the reality of those around us today that will not if they are not in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would open our mouths boldly, that we might point people to the ultimate ark, and that they would run to him for refuge. We pray this in Jesus' name.